The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room that's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hello and welcome to the Engine Room Podcast. Yet again, I've got a real treat today. I've got some guests that have flown all the way in from Adelaide, um, the the home of Hague's, but that's another story. And um, I've got another guest that's really unique because yet again, we've got a business that's been going for 50 years. So it's going to be very exciting. And I'd like to start by just reading off the first line of their website, and that'll give you the tone of, uh, of, of sort of the lightheartedness they have around themselves and what they like to project for not only their own team members, but the way they the way they operate. So the 80s were an exciting time in Australia. It saw the birth of Pac-Man, shoulder pads, post-it notes, and a little family business in its second generation that has evolved to become Calder Wealth Management. And with that, I'd like to welcome Ben Calder and Ivana Sanzari to the microphone. Welcome. Thanks, Roxy. Thank you. Hello. And uh, I did the Hague's joke um, just to kick it off because uh, Ivana, maybe maybe uh, enlighten the world to the truly horrific uh, self-help um, task that you've given yourself. I'm going for a thousand days, no chocolate. I'm currently at 820 days, which means I haven't had chocolate for over two years. So the home of Hague's in Adelaide, no chocolate for two years. So we're hoping that uh, we hope there's big celebrations for you, and the celebrations for your 1,000 days probably might be almost as big as Ben your celebrations recently for Calder Wealth turning 50 years old. How are they? Uh, really good. I mean, we're just getting started. So um, this year is you know it's 50 years this year. Uh, so we've got quite a few events planned over the year with the team and for our you know the broader um, client group to say thank you um and so we started with a a video and um we got my my father in uh for to cut a movie which was fun and i think they're putting together a bloopers reel at the moment when apparently there's a lot more um to watch in the bloopers than there was in the in the final cut and uh, i've seen the video um and if you want a good look at ben calder throughout the ages um, with all the fashion faux pas from uh, the 80s, 90s, noughties and, and to now, then it'll be a well worth the thing. But I suppose it'd be good for the audience just to get a bit of a feel for um, yourselves individually. Yes, you've been going a long time, but this is colder 2.0 or 3.0 and, and we're all about a growth platform. And we were only talking earlier, Ivana, about, you know, what you guys are looking to achieve, you know, in the next two or three years, which is pretty significant growth. So maybe start with, with yourself, Ben. When did you uh, get into the business and what's been your journey to, to um, where you are right now? Um, yeah, I, I guess um, I've always had exposure to the industry growing up. Um, Dad was an advisor um, for a long time. Um, I probably didn't think I would ever sort of go down that route. Um, but um, strangely enough, in uh, probably 93, I started with um, Norwich Union in what they used to have is like an internship in the life company and you work across the different areas and um, 
I ultimately ended up one of the one of the areas was Norwich uh, Advisor Services where we looked after all the the life agents, and I sort of thought it looked like they were having a pretty good life at the time uh, in the early nineties, and I, I chose to move into into that path from there. And but you did spend a little bit of time in the United Kingdom, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So um, started as an advisor, was was lived in Melbourne for a while, uh, moved back to Adelaide, and then. Um, had an opportunity to go work in the UK, um, work with um, National Australia Bank uh, based out of London for a while, um, sort of with their uh, as their financial planning manager um, in London under the Clydesdale Bank brand, um, and that was brilliant. I had an am- amazing time, learned a lot of uh, what to do and uh, probably even more of what not to do. And when did you move back to Australia? Uh, about 01, 2001. And that, that coincided with you moving sort of your, your, your feet underneath the family business or was there an interim? Yeah, no, that was um, – I'd been away. So so before moving away, um, the, the call to wealth business as it is now was predominantly a life insurance advisory business. Um, I had a financial planning business. So they used to sort of refer their clients some, you know, you'd get a call from dad and say, do you, mate, do you, do you know what an allocated pension is? Um, so, Sure. Um, so, so this is in the same town. Just to rewind, yeah, so yeah. you're in Melbourne or Adelaide at the time. Th- this was in Adelaide, right? Yeah. So, um, your, your your father was referring sort of more technical, holistic planning to you, and you were utilising his services for for insurance. Is that correct? Yep, absolutely. Okay. Um, and that sort of grew really quickly, and probably was getting pretty serious where sort of the partners in Call to Wealth at the time were like, you know, you should bring your business in and come in and work with us and. Um, and that's why I sort of I thought I, I want to go to the UK and work away because sort of once I sort of embed myself here, um, you know, I, I'm locked in sort of thing. So, um, yeah, so that's sort of how the, the, the financial planning bit started. And then on coming back from the UK, um, we'd sort of negotiated a deal, I guess, while I was away. And when the sort of deal looked right enough, I came back, merged in that the business that I had still running in Adelaide, um, in with with those guys, and um, we sort of set out a bit of a plan for their 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 succession over the coming 10, 10 plus years. Fast forward to twenty twenty four, has all that succession occurred smoothly? Um, you know, you are the CEO of the business as we speak. I'm assuming so, but is that all played out the way that you'd hoped? Uh, better. Oh, wow. um, yeah, no, it's it. I guess because we had such a long time to transition the clients and work through all of that, um, the other guys were in no mad rush to move into retirement, etc. So, um, I uh, bought the other partners out roughly about eight years ago, um, and um, you know we still have all, all the clients that they sort of personally looked after and their next generation and, and possibly moving into third generation of those families now. Um, so so we- G3 is the terminology, isn't it? It's a, and, yeah. and a slow handover was sort of sounded like the key to the success, was it? It was just safe, um, yeah. you know, safe. And um, I think for clients it was, it was pretty seamless, you know. Um, other partners and I sort of sat in meetings together and, and we probably did that for a while. We could have transitioned it much faster if we – um, if that was the aim, but you know, we sort of just were all happy to work together. We all brought different uh, skill sets to the table, um, so it was really quite complimentary. And it's pretty good to be working with your old man. I, I had a ball doing that. Um, no regrets whatsoever. So you've spoken about uh, working with uh, your your father, but um, you're a father yourself. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, how how do you balance it? Not well, probably. Um, I, I do the best I can. Um, I've got sort of teenage kids, uh, 17, 17 and 14. Oh, I've got that. That's an upset. It, some days are better than others. <laughs> yeah, it's it's definitely, you know, you think when they're little, oh, it gets easier and obviously it's it's getting worse. But um, um, they're really sporty kids. Um, I sort of, you know, um, I have my kids for a, a really good chunk of, uh, of time um, and so managing them, what they want to do, the business, you know, they're the priorities. There's not much room for much else, to be honest, the last few years, but I wouldn't change any of it. Oh, perfect, perfect. And, and Ivana, when did you enter into this world, um, the colder world? And maybe what were you doing prior to that? So the colder world, I, well, I joined Calder Wealth Management three years ago. March is my 
anniversary month. So it's been three. Well, we can do awesome a performance years. review during yeah. this podcast. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Let's Let's go live. Yeah. We're, we're live streaming it. <laughs> I'm oh, feeling ben, pressure. Tell me. Tell me. <laughs> no. I joined Quarter Wealth three years ago. No regrets joining. Um, but I started in the industry back in 2002 when I realized I didn't want to be at uni anymore, much to my mum's disappointment. And I didn't pick the industry. I just picked a job and that was with Colonial First Aid. After that, I worked in... Um, Commonwealth Bank in their financial planning division, coordinating a team of financial planners. When my time there ended because I was going to have a baby, I um, um, finished up at Commonwealth Bank. I moved into licensee land. I had lots of fun there as I have in all of my roles that I've worked in. I then spent some time in smaller one advisor practices just in a, in a support role uh, in between having kids. After that, I decided to actually have a break from the industry and I spent a couple of years working in a very popular and busy hospitality business in Adelaide, which has over 100 staff. I was doing their work health and safety and then I moved into people and culture and that role for me was invaluable. I learned a lot. I met a lot of awesome people working with diverse such a diverse group of people and having difficult conversations and lots of conversations, I think, set me up for this role as practice manager with Calder Wealth. Four kids later, my sister got in touch and said that Ben Calder was looking for a, or is looking for a practice manager because uh, he reached out to her first. <laughs> Didn't know you yet. <laughs> well, you know what's funny about this story is normally – Normally the CEO goes, yeah, we went through an exhaustive sort of, you know, search and whatnot. But in fact, Avani, you've been looking after hundreds of financial planners. So you sort of were interviewing him the other way going, yeah. I've seen what everyone else is doing. What's, what's so special about you? Yeah. And I suppose I'm going to ask the question. Yeah. So why, what made you join? What made me you join? join Calder. You join you, Calder. You yeah. had visibility in your previous life of all the other planners, yeah. everyone doing things. What drove you to wanting to join with uh, uh, Calder Wealth? I think the professionalism, everything was organized. It wasn't – it It was a business it, and it, you could feel that it was a business. It wasn't just an advisor in an office with the support staff. Yeah, it was structured, organized, and it, it just felt right. And when – so, and moving on, you know, three years from here, and we're going to talk a bit about sort of when we change gears about um, what your role is now and how you've grown that. But I was just really interested. I know you took a breath when I asked what made you join because I saw Ben immediately turn around and give you the, the stare, the 90-mile stare. But I think you completely summed it up. You know, this is an engine room podcast. What we're trying to encourage is is the evolution of professionally run practices that allow – financial advisors to achieve their goals and their client goals. So so um, inadvertently, the, you've, you've probably nailed the brief. Um, and you mentioned you've, you've, got, you've got quite a few young kids and so you, mm-hmm. must, um, you must be very, very good at time management. And I know that because you sent through one of the most detailed answers to all of the questions I've ever had in my life. So congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, having four small children that are all in primary school still uh, – is very busy. My husband is self-employed and I help him in his business and I have other interests that I volunteer my time with as well on top of work and kids and, um, yeah, we're very heavily involved in surf life saving and I help run a, um, a language school in Adelaide. So I think I just function better when I keep busy and just forces me to be really organized and on top of everything. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for, for sharing your story there, guys. And what I'd love to hear now is where we're at with Colder now. I'd love to get a, a bit of a feel. So for everyone listening out there who go, that makes a bit of sense. I also don't like chocolate, of which there'll be none. But the good news is in a hundred and something days, we're back on. Um, and figuring out, well, um, how do you make good with all of those promises to yourself and your advisors? So um, can I ask uh, maybe, Ivana, in relation to how you run the business or you organise the advisors, um, maybe get us a bit of a feel for, for um, you know, do you run a, a, a pod structure? I think, in fact, I think, Ben, we've spoken before, you, you run a, a diamond structure, which I might I might get you to talk about, the, the, the well, either of you to talk about the diamond structure. Um, so who would like to go first? To regardless, because it's actually a really cool structure from, is it the Herbus? Yeah, Herbus. 
Herbers, yeah. So we, we might include a link, Kieran, to, to the Herbers website there because, you know, I, I've heard this story off, off, off mic before and it's, it's, a, it's a cracking structure that, that I think a lot of people should look at. So over to you, what's the diamond structure and, um, and then how do you implement it? I think, look, traditionally as we've grown from being a, a smaller practice to, I guess, a medium-sized business, sort of with the resources, you sort of stack them in a silo type arrangement. So, you know, you have an advisor and they have um, some admin support or a CSO and then maybe a power planner, et cetera. As we've sort of grown, we, and, and we only moved to Diamond uh, diamond Team Structures last year. Great. Yeah. Um, what were you previously, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, individual silos. Okay. Yeah. So the classic pod system that a lot of the listeners would be familiar because I often say to pod or not to pod, but are now out of a third derivation. Yeah. So it's really like just, you know, before it was one big pod and now we've broken them up into three, into three diamond team structures. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've got advisors in there that obviously complement each other. They now have associates who sit behind them to do a lot of the work that you know, they need to learn to become advisors over time and support those advice and to leverage those advisors. Um, so they work uh, teams within a, a team, if you like, and those resources can be shared um, between diamonds, et cetera. And then sort of management, um, we have sort of offshoring um, services. Um, they all operate um, as shared services that support the advice teams. Okay, so you've got the three advice teams, you've got a shared services for sort of output. Um, and and can I ask, if that led, is there a lead advisor in each one of those three um, teams? Yes. Okay. And, so- and, and the, the, you know, the, uh, under the, the Herber's model effectively is that sort of, you know, those you have sort of a senior lead and then uh, lead advisors and, um, with growth and I guess career progression for the advisors is for them to have the opportunity to, to move to a senior lead where they maybe run their own team at some point. Um, probably the other thing that we find supports it um, is career pa- career pathing and I think we're going to talk about people and culture and um, stuff Absolutely. today. But um, running those structures, those formal structures, we can sort of see how much capacity we have. Um, so we know when we need to hire next and, um, and, and we can, we can really map out a pathway for those younger, um, younger university grads, if you like, that want to be part of our industry. Um, and so we can show them a pathway with timelines and we know when they're going to get there based on those structures. I often think about um, people entering the industry and um, I think, Ivana, you mentioned that your first couple of jobs are in, in smaller or, or subscale mm. businesses. Great people, but still, as someone who's young who wanted to learn the ropes, it's sort of quite limiting and you probably found yourself having to make it up a bit as you go along, like a lot of people. But entering into this quite rigid structure where there is hierarchy, where where you – so hierarchy as far as tasks, but but flat management as far as communication, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, I, I think, is the vibe. Um, so the questions I then had to, uh, to ask yourself, Vana, is how do you know when you get to capacity – and just something practically. So does that mean if I'm a client, and in a second I'm going to ask a bit about the types of clients you've got, do I then have a meeting with more than one person in the meeting or is it more than one person in my team to implement? You've got more than – or the client will have more than one person in their team. So generally they'll meet with the advisor and um, after that meeting the advisor will then meet with the associate, talk about what happened or what the meeting was about and what the objective is and then the associate will formulate the strategy and then send off the request and then we've got the client associate in the team who does, I guess, the liaison with between the client and the um, associate and implementing all their so, work. So. so the client will get correspondence from the people in their team and when yeah. they come on board as a new client, do they get told that they've got a portfolio of people in your group to look after them? Absolutely. And that's part of your sort of unique sales, your position piece with them saying that, you know, because ultimately, I mean, as an advisor of many years, clients love talking, but they also understand that the two hours that I've just taken about an advisor is two hours that someone else is not utilizing them. And I might be that someone else quite often, right? So having that scalability is, is probably, um, you know, very relevant. And how do you know when they get to capacity, Ivana? When the advisor gets to capacity the or team. the team? Yeah, the team. When the team gets to capacity well we've got a a metric that each team needs to 
have, and that's what we think is or the fess up. What's, what's your metric? Households. Households. Okay. So, so let's, let's, let's answer that question with, with how many households they have. And then I wouldn't mind asking you, Ben, just the sorts of clients that you've got today mm-hmm. and where your aspire, where your aspirations are as far as the types of clients. Um, I might just on that with the households. So under a silo structure, for example, we think probably about 120 from the types of clients we look after per advisor, um, is, is about they capping out. You know, um, at, at around and that's that. typically a couple of meetings a year, or what's the what's, uh, what's the yeah? Difference? So usually, sort of that would be one um, one formal where sort of all cash flow modelling's yep. redone, everything, all the boxes are ticked, yep. all um, all objectives revisited. But yes, there, there's there there typically will be another meeting for some other. You know, um, it's ad hoc it things that come up yeah, as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, but then sort of when we move to that diamond team structure and you put an associate into a team, so two lead advisors with an associate should easily be able to go to sort of 150 plus households per advisor. But what do they look like? What's a client look like? Uh, for us, uh, ideal client for us is mass affluent pre-retiree basically so yeah. do you um, mind if they're self-employed or, or, or salaried no we um we we don't and we have some advisors who sort of have an accountancy background and they're probably better to work with the smes um and a lot of our advisors at, sort of at, as time has gone on they get more familiar with working with different subgroups of that category if you like um so it's pretty easy to match a new client we're onboarding with with the right advisor that has understands intimately what their issues are i I just want to drill down on that point so you mentioned we're onboarding them so the client is onboarded by the overall company there's obviously a lead advisor in play but at some stage you might say well that particular client it might have a you know a, a bunch of complex tax affairs might be best served potentially by one of your other business units is that correct absolutely okay so so how how does the horse trading work um it's really i guess that's probably another way of managing capacity so we've as those associates are coming through and ivana was talking about before the associates do take a lot of that work away from the lead advisors but they also as they're moving through PY, those associates are going into those meetings as well, which is part of their development. Oh, yep. And ultimately, they're going to pick up a pool of um, families um, to look after and still work in that team structure. Um, but that's how they'll sort of step out into, advi- you know, being an advisor in their own right and managing their own um, client groups. And. Um, knowing your business, you're a multidiscipline practice as well. So, not only are the clients being serviced for financial planning, but they've got others, other other sort of disciplines as well. Maybe explain how they fit into the overall picture. Uh, yep. So, um, as I said earlier, the business sort of was really founded on life insurance advice. Um, so, that's still a huge part of of our business. There's probably never been a greater need for it um, in our industry um, than what there is now. So. We're still very focused on that. Um, so for those clients that accumulate a pre-retirees that still will do all that in-house, uh, we also do lending, mortgage broking and asset finance, all that stuff in-house. Um, so the clients can sort of get that holistic um, solution, I guess, to um, everything they're trying to achieve. So those others sort of with insurance and with debt, for example, um, they sort of sit in, in shared services and go in and support those advice teams as they need the help. So, team, multidiscipline practices now. I ran a multidiscipline practice for nearly 20 years. So that's the broking, the accounting, the financial planning. What I found was that, that, that definitely the clients felt like it was all part of it. But what I'm interested is, is – um, how do you uh, coordinate those other disciplines from a from from the back end? You know, how do they talk to each other? Do you ha- do you include them in your your daily huddles or whatever? You know, maybe I don't mind who answers it, but 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 what's what's how does it work for for the multidiscipline aspect of your business? So it's regardless of um, <clears throat> who sits in what area, it's one team. So we that said. We do, you know, whether it's mortgage broking or it's insurance or they have their own teams. Um, so there's huddles for them, um, 
huddles for all the teams, uh, which we do on a sort of on a Tuesday, the first half of the day on Tuesday is gone with all that stuff. So we can sort of let everyone get on with their work for the rest of the week. Um, but they, regardless of which discipline they sit in, um, they are part of the, the greater team and attend everything um, as a team. They all report into Ivana um, and she manages workflow and, you know, whatever issues come up with them uh, and, to support them. And when we're talking about workflow, um, we, we might as well get straight into the nitty-gritty of the tech stack. So um, maybe give us a feel for what's the, what's the technology stack that you guys are operating with and, and um, you know, is there anything on your wish list? Mm, wish list, better explain. <laughs> uh, no, so we use, we sit in the Microsoft environment, we use the Microsoft environment, so Teams is massive for us and it just makes everything so efficient. Because you have a few um, um, different uh, locations these days, is that right? Yeah. So Where, whereabouts are they? So head office is Unley. <laughs> And then we've got other offices in South Australia. We've got Victor Harbour, Mount Barker, and one in the Barossa Valley. And then we also have um, some team that are offshore in the Philippines and Sri Lanka. And running – so on the Tuesdays, as, as Ben was saying, when you do your um, uh, your big weeklies, um, that's a combination of in-person and also people on using the teams, yeah? Yeah, that's right. So Tuesdays is our busiest day in the office because everybody likes to be – together in person for these meetings and then they break off into their workflow meetings for their pods but yeah so Tuesdays is well everyone joins via teams for the the big team meeting and then that breaks off into the advice team and then from there the individual pods go off and meet and yeah and with um with advice production um uh, are you using the x plan we are tool yes. okay well yeah. there's a whole other podcast series on on iris than uh, that that's coming up so we won't try and solve the, their their issues problems and opportunities but um is there anything else that you plug in so we use x plan a lot because why not it 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 does work um it's it's slow sometimes but if we've got it, we might as well make the most of it. Uh, we use LastPass and Wealth Central, which is available through our licensee. That's and who are you licensed through? Consultum. Consultum. Okay, so Wealth Central um, has come through the Consultum, and that's uh, from memory. That's a that's a client facing tool. Is that it correct? Is, yeah. So so Ben, do they use use that in all the meetings or, or, or reviews? These these annual reviews you're talking about? Um, we've sort of just it, we're we're still. We started implementing it into the business uh, roughly maybe a year ago. So as a yeah, it is it's a client facing tool. We still sort of you know use X Tools Plus for all of our modeling and um, gotcha. for cash flow modeling. Um, but it is really it's really easy to to use um, the feedback from clients who are IT savvy. You're always going to have clients that still want a piece of paper, I guess. Yep. But, um, um, yeah, that's been really a really good way of uh, collecting data and, and pushing data straight through into a CRM um, without human duplication. And-, and and once it's in the CRM, Ivana, do you use, um, uh, use threads or what sort of workflow management do you use? Yeah, absolutely use threads. It's um, made things so much more efficient. Did you never used to use threads? It sounds like this is a new thing. <laughs> uh, we've had threads for a couple of years. And they keep evolving. We keep adding a new thread. We think of a, you know, we realize there's a process that needs a thread. So we build a thread to cover everything. Just that way, if um, anyone can pick up a task and know where where it's at and continue. And with the with the accounting um, business and the, the mortgage breaking business, they've got their own tech as well, like zeros, MYABs, sales tracker, whatever it is. Um, uh, the holy grail, and, the, and this is, we don't have to solve everything in this particular podcast, is is integrating those. How, how do you how do you transfer or what information between them? Because I'm really interested because um, it's it's always a, a bit of a bugbear that you have to duplicate information. From there, but have you guys got any any sort of workarounds? Uh, I guess we use SharePoint, and that's where everyone can access the clients' data and their information. Whilst the CRMs that they use don't talk to each other, we've got SharePoint, so that solves. Oh, perfect, and Microsoft's pretty solid on the data security these days. So it is. Yeah. Well, now I was just um, you're here. You're flying in from Adelaide, as flattered as Kieran the sound guy, and I are to have you in person. 
You also happen to be uh, in Sydney um, visiting um, a conference. Um, so I wouldn't mind asking, uh, you know, when you've got your clients and what sort of investments, do you use an SMA, do you use, you know, MDAs? It'd be good just to get a feel for how you, you know, if I'm sitting in your business, what are the tools that I have for my investment side? So first of all, what are you here for today? Uh, so we're, we've come up to Sydney for uh, Dimensional's got their practice management symposium, uh, which starts tomorrow. Always heaps of great insights, uh, talking to other sort of other practices from around the country. Um, so the focus, you know, Ivana and I are here because it's, it's focused wholly on practice management and that's sort of our wheelhouse, I guess, these days. Um, so I guess, and I, I guess that relationship with Dimensional um, has been a pretty transformational one for the business. When did it start? Uh, I think we've been working with Dimensional now for o- almost 14 years, I think, um, if I'm wrong, 12 to 14 years, something like that. Um, I guess um, we sort of like their investment philosophy after coming from a very active background prior to that and GFC coming and decimating us as hard as everyone else. the mate. indexes. Yeah, so, you know, sort of we were all sort of expecting a lot more protection in portfolios than what we saw. So um, I needed to rethink um, the wheel on that. So... We've um, been working with Dimensional. Uh, we run majority, um, you know, of, we have our own blends around the Dimensional strategies um, and we, we pretty much run most most client uh, money, you know, relative to risk profile and stuff and, like and that. Do you think by taking a bit of that intellectual heavy lifting as far as uh, sort of scaffolding off the advisors day to day that they can be less – feeling like they have to be individual fund managers and more focused on the family units. Absolutely. We we want I want all their time in the you know talking to families about what's important to them not bedazzling them with some snippet of information from a market that they've got that ultimately you know could turn out to be they won't know whether through skill or luck they were right or wrong. So Now, now I've been going a whole year and that is the first bedazzled comment so um well done you're There's welcome the, you're welcome you and it it it, it took uh the uh, a, a trip across um the uh the desert to come over here and, and bedazzle us and now that we've got the bedazzling out of the way um in relation to colder wealth management it uh, takes me back to, um, to the, the swifty moment that happened in this city uh, a few months ago what i'd love to do is parlay into people and culture and ivana the way i like to to, to frame this one up is sort of ask you three barreled question. So why do people join you? Why do they stay and how do they grow? Over to you. Um, I think they join us probably for the same reason that I joined, that they can see that it's a business and um, they have a career. With Call to Wealth, they, the reason they stay is because they're well supported, they're here to do a job and they get to do that job with a really awesome group of people who treat each other with with respect but also have fun. Yeah, they come to work to do something that they really care about, that they're passionate about, and they don't have to worry about anything else. Anytime they have an issue, they come and see me. We work together. We fix it. We act really quickly. And would you say that's your management style, sort of open-door policy for comms? Yes, definitely. Okay, so – I mean, juggling a, juggling a young family and, and a bunch of people, you're probably very used to making decisions on the run and, and communicating on the run. Now, tell me, do you ever – is it a hybrid structure as far as – I know you've got various offices, yep. but uh, post-COVID, um, what does it look like to work in your business day-to-day? So we do have flexible working. We've got three days in an office, so any one of our offices, and people can work from home two days a week. Advisors usually can do whatever they like They you know when they have client meetings and they work around that. But for the support staff, that's it's the three in an office, two from home. But people generally choose to be in the office more than that. Interesting. Which is Why do you think that is? Because it's a good place to be. And the team collaboration that happens when everyone's physically together is awesome. And you can't get that online. But I understand. We, we work with the individual. So we work with each team member, what's going on with them and what you know their family situation is like. And so we cater for that and some people have to leave earlier to pick up children or they'll work in the Mount Barker office on certain days because it's closer to their kids school and it just allows them to 
work. Oh, and so you have people both. going between offices as well. So that, that's that's a possibility in your business. Yes. Okay. Okay. So if you're out there in South Australia and you, you're contemplating what to next and you've got – now, all of these suburbs that you've rattled off, I'm pretending to know exactly where <laughs> they are, but how far apart are they? Well, Unley's obviously central. Then. Unley's the, the flash part of Adelaide from memory, is that right? Yeah, very it's pretty flash. nice. Very flash, very flash. <laughs> yeah. Nice food and, and, and a few half-decent pubs. So, sorry, Unley yeah. and? So, Mount Barker is in the Adelaide Hills. That's about 20, 25 minutes from the Unley office. Victor Harbour's on the Flurio. That's about an hour and a half, hour and about, 20. About an hour. And then uh, Barossa Valley with the new – there's a motorway which makes it very – quick to get there now, but that is also about an hour from Unley. Oh, right. Well. And so can I ask, just, just um, heading off on a tangent, um, you recently made an acquisition, which I saw on, on, on social media, and, and that was the Barossa Valley business, is that correct? Or which yep. one was that? Yeah, that's the Barossa business. Yeah. Okay. And when, how did that come about? I mean, ben, did, did they approach you guys or what, what was the... Um, yeah. So the, that, that business um, has been probably operating... Um, predominantly life insurance and some superannuation advice, um, a bit of planning in there. Um, that's been operating for probably over 30 years and that principal was looking for a, a succession plan. Um, he was the only advisor in that practice, work, you know, with a few staff, um, similar to what we are talking about earlier, wearing a million different hats. Um, and I guess, you know, he was uh, wanted to transition um, with – we wanted to be have an office. We want to cover all the bases in South Australia. Um, and so um, the principal, Murray, who I've known for uh, for many years, uh, we had a few discussions around it and pretty quickly we we worked out that we we're both a pretty good fit for each other. And, um, yeah, so he's uh, transitioning. We've been working at that for the last year and he'll be sort of transitioning out into his next stage of life. Um in just over a month's time, it's been very successful. Awesome. So that was that's, that's one year ago, just to clarify. Yep. yep. And Ivana, did they did they plug day one into your operational structure, or has it been a phase in? Well, they plugged in from day one, and then they yeah integrated from there, learning our processes. They but they sat in our environment from day one in okay. Microsoft Teams, our X plan, and then everyone's just worked really closely with them to help onboard them with the call to wealth processes and how we do things and but also looking after their clients bringing them in perfect yeah perfect and um this is your first one yes okay so is this a trend yes yes Yes, so I tell you the double yeses, the double yeses. So um, I would, I'll come back to that in a second. Now, um, where, how do you measure? So you measure success on households. How do you measure activity? So from because um, you've got shared services with 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 um, uh, offshoring, okay, of which you know that I'm involved. Mm-hmm. Um, so how do you know what's a good day from for those guys? How do you know what's a good day for your associates? How do you measure things? Again, mainly um, sort of we've got sort of benchmarks, I guess, that we – not that they're things that you really need to enforce much at all sort of – you know, we've got, like Ivana said before, we've got an amazing team. We've got, you know, some of our senior advisors have been with us over 15 years um, and a lot of other staff, you know, and a lot of other staff in other roles who have been with us over 10 years. Um, so they all work – pretty seamlessly together so we, they don't need to be and we're very much a business that we say if we need to micromanage you this isn't the right place we sort of employ adults and expect them to be adults so um employ adults and expect them to be adults yeah so yeah, it's a classic it's you know from a, we, we i guess we have targets on you know roughly how many you know, I guess starting with the households, what that looks like, obviously how many meetings that translates into, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and all the processes um, are set up to run to support all of that and we can pull whatever reporting we need to out of that as we need it. And, Ivana, in the voluminous uh, notes that you sent through to me earlier, which is uh, – thank you very much <laughs> about that. You mentioned that um, you do formal annual reviews with uh, team members – do. How does that work in your world? And, and what, uh, what would you advise people who are listening who potentially are just trying to get their head around managing people? 
So, yeah, we do do the formal annualised reviews, but we do regular check-ins. So we don't just wait for that, you know, once a year event to find out what's happening um, or share feedback or get their feedback. But with that annual review, we would send a pretty lengthy questionnaire out to all the team members. I think it takes them about an hour to complete. Oh, wow. There's lots of questions about what what they think the business does well, what could the business do better, what they think they've done well, what could they do better, what are their goals for the year, how have they contributed to the business, lots and of do you, questions. And what sort of feedback do you get? Not specifically, but do you have people who, who give long-form answers? Yes. Yeah, it's varied, actually. People are very succinct in some of their answers and some people like to give lot very detailed answers. And in that, we also ask... Um, everyone for 360 fear at peer feedback. So, you know, people that they work closely with, what, you know, what's one thing that Ben does well, what's one thing Ben could do better. Perfect. And, um, we also in that process ask for their, their goals and objectives, their one, three and five year plan. So we yep. know what's happening in their world personally, professionally. And that, that assists for, you know, you mentioned earlier about where they're at in their life stage and being flexible around, um, the working environment. And, you know, some people make up time as well. So it's all sort of fits hand, hand in gloves, correct? Yes. Yeah. 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 So after they complete that questionnaire, we collate all the answers, review it all. And then we have, um, the review, we hold the review off site away from the office so they can fully relax. And so you've yeah. got uh, a, a site in the um, Adelaide Hills, I um, wine, and a site yeah. in the Barossa, a wine. Yeah, I'm assuming you, yeah. you're not you, devoid you're of you're not devoid of locations. I assume you're noticing no. the trend here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am, I am. And look, um, Karen, the Sianga, next time we interview these guys, we could just give them a hint and bring a cheese board and just <laughs> let them let them fill in the gaps. How's that sound? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, on that jovial aside. What does fun look like? So say, for instance, that you've got all these checks and balances and everyone's doing the right job and you, you achieve for the quarter or for the how, how do you guys celebrate? Well, we celebrate by acknowledging all our milestones as they happen in team meetings and, you know, in teams messages. Um, you know, end of financial year, we'll go out and have a team dinner. We do a team offsite with a fun activity for team bonding with, and we'll do a business update as well. Um, we always celebrate Christmas in style and Friday afternoon drinks in the office. Just, yeah, nothing too over the top, but it's just fun and relaxed and no pressure. And, and what's the total headcount of the business across all the sites? So 18 in Australia and six yep. offshore. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So quite often, um, you know, when we talk to our, our community, the ensemble community, some people are in organisations such as yourself and some aren't. And some of them um, long to be in businesses such as yourself. And, and, and why that is is that a lot of us were quite social creatures when we did our, um, you know, went to university quite often. We did our courses. We're quite social creatures. We might have, um, uh, like Ben here, we might have gone and worked for a, a larger corporate with lots of people. And then you went into financial planning and it becomes a very solitary game, you know, because they're quite often very small businesses. And what I'm seeing, and, and you guys are a testament to that, is just the evolution of a bit of scale. You know, I think, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is my own personal experience, going from naught to 10 people in your business can be just done through the charisma of the CEO. You know, you can just write the revenue to fix problems. Going from 10 to 30 is the hardest part of the journey because you can't fix it with the tools you're used to. You, you have to do exactly what you guys have done. You've got to invest in systems and processes but you're not, you don't have the budget of a, ma- a multinational. So everything's very much, you know, lean management, lean thinking, jack of all trades. In saying all of that, given that you're 18 and 6, so you're 25, what's the aspiration for growing the business for yourselves? You I mean, you make people do their one, three, and five years goals. In three years' time, where would you like to see Calder as far as headcount? 40. Yeah, I'd say probably um, where. <laughs> I guess what we, Ivana touched on it before. Um, we want people to be able, we want the advisors to give advice. That's what they enjoy doing. It's that relationship piece, um, not doing any of the support work. So we need to continue to scale to support all of, you know, 
all of the team in their roles. Um, so I, in regards to an exact number or whatever, I, I, I think, you know, we we probably be sort of double our size we are now in the next three to five. Um, that will allow us to career path more more juniors through, support uh, senior long-term staff. Um, scale will just allow everyone to get what they want as well as giving all the, I guess, the benefits of a larger company but the benefits of a smaller business, that sort of family feel of a smaller business but with all of the, you know, ability to to pay really commercially, do all the fun things, yep. you know, have all of the employee value proposition support. Um, that that's where we want. That's where we're going. Um, so you know, we we grow very strongly organically. We've grown to this date uh, to this stage organically with one um, with one one tuck in, and uh, we'll do more of those um, as they make sense. Um, we, we might touch on the the, the, the tuck ins towards the end of, end of the session here, but. Um, if I'm doing my maths correctly, if you want, want to get to sort of that, that 40, 40 to 50 uh, sort of headcount, given you've got three sort of diamond structures at the moment, does that, does that just mean you go to six? So you've already built the foundations. Is that what you, you visualise, Ivana? I think from the diamond structures, we'll move to a, a house team. Oh, oh new words. Yeah. New What's a house yeah. team? Come on, we're on this journey now. You're too far gone. We have to explain what it means. If you think about the bottom of the diamond, which is your associate advisor. Yep. That mold that splits out into two, so you've got a diamond top with a with a square bottom, like, like a, gotcha. house, a house shape. Ah, got gotcha, you. Gotcha. So we bring more associates to. Support I can do that stick figure drawings, so yeah. I'm, I'm following you literally, like very well. sticks. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Okay. So so that, that you've got the foundations of scalability. Okay. Great. Now, and you mentioned that um, uh, you've got. You know, as you get bigger, that you've got things like you can pay commercially, um, you know, your own Adelaide, which is an interesting market, actually, because, you know, historically, Adelaide had an exodus of talent to Melbourne. A lot of young people would do that. And is that part of the strategy to, to try and attract not just advisors, but I think we were talking earlier, you'd love just to attract like the best and brightest for other roles, like operations, et cetera. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Yes. We want to attract all future talent for any of the roles, associates, the support support staff. So, yeah. so before you head over to Melbourne, maybe maybe just make a phone call, correct? Yeah, you can stay in Adelaide. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Well, I think we we're sort of you know it's it is definitely becoming a bit of a vacuum from a talent point of view, and a, 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 you know sort of some of the I think as some of the more recent um, team members that have joined us, they have sort of gravitated towards us. We weren't necessarily looking for them, um, and I think. That's, you know, I'm proud of that. Um, and I think more and more of that will, will happen. And we're, we're seeing people that are applying for roles um, that currently live in Melbourne and other states that are, you know, looking to move to, to Adelaide. Well, that's right. I mean, if, if COVID's taught us anything, people have um, the ability to, to, to move places. And, and if you're living in uh, Sydney and Melbourne and you're a young person or even Brisbane, the, the cost of, the cost of uh, that lifestyle that you, ha- you have, especially the housing cost, can sometimes feel pretty, pretty hard to, to, to overwhelming. Correct. That's a good word. Um, I also, um, when we were chatting earlier, um, I, I proudly said that you know, one of the businesses I'm associated with, with um, Vital Business Partners, um, had achieved B Corp. And I didn't realize that you guys are on that same journey. So maybe give me an update of, of, of where you're at and what, why, what made you do it. I mean, I know why we did it, but I'm really interested in that and against the backdrop of attracting talent. Yeah, so um, B Corp's been on the cards for us for a little while, or, but it's a massive task to undertake. Oh, yeah. As you know, yep. that certification process is massive and it, it... It's only in the thousands in the world. Like there's not even like hundreds of thousands. Yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah. very, very, yeah. very hard to get. Yes, and yeah, the process is, is so rigorous and... You need a lot of dedication and time and there's a lot of change that happens within the business as part of the certification change for good. Uh, so we're probably three quarters of the way through. We should be in a position to submit our application in, in about three months, I think. Wow. We'll hold there's, you to that. Yeah. <laughs> so we've done a lot of work. Um, yeah, I'm very excited to get that beat call. And, and I know why we did it at, at VBP, but what was your motivation, Ben? So we've we're talking before about structure, and we're talking a lot about 
structure and um, B Corp for I, you know, sort of ran into B Corp oh, years ago. I met with a firm in London actually and they just got B Corp accreditation and in the US if you're a B Corp, it's sort of other tax benefits, etc. But really, if you're I listening, think, Australian government, uh, yeah, get on board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ring us five five five. Give us a hand. Help us. <laughs> um, so, the, the, I guess the values align with B Corp. Sort of, you know, the yeah. three P's. You know, it's about people, planet, profit, basically. And and as a business, we think um, that aligns um, very well with us value wise. Um, and I think. With structure, B Corp gives you a really good framework for making decisions around how you look at things in the world and and how what policies you should have in place as a business to sort of you know participate and and operate a business for good, not just for for profit. So, and that's something Ivana's been running, and she does that. We have a you know a team um, of beekeepers um, in in the in the business who work through this, and and then they it, it's something that the whole team is in is involved and, and has an input into um, as we go through this process. And look, the payoff comes in the fact that you become uber attractive to especially younger people who these days are looking at a broad range of why they work for an organisation and, and the purpose of what their organisation is about. And I suppose in that vein as well, um, uh, given that you have had been a successful business, do you, do, you, do you support any charities or do you have a methodology for doing that? Yeah, we've actually, as part of the B Corp process, we've introduced a charitable giving policy. Cool. How does that work? Uh, well, we had a pool of money that will, you know, is for a donation to a charitable organisation and um, we the team voted for – well, actually, the team had to pitch a charity that was close to their heart. Awesome. To the team. Yeah. To it to the broader team and there were four pitches for uh, charities put forward and then everybody votes. We had an uh, equal tie so there was two winners and so we've split that money and donated it to the two charities of choice. Yes, yeah, so we make a more meaningful contribute instead of, you know, we sort of focus that down, make a more meaningful contribution. What, what do you mean by meaningful, Ben? Um, more money. Okay, so for commercially, so look, you've got so what you've done is you've engaged your team in the process. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I've spoken with, and I know people who who are very generous, like very generous people, but quite often it's just the CEO making a captain's call to to a project, or or it might have been that, but but the methodology that you have, and so that's a annual methodology. Right? Yes, that's yep. right. And yeah. and secondary to that, we support if they want to, you know, up to an up to a amount of money if they give to a charity will will match that oh, wonderful. for something that they're wonderful they're passionate about okay awesome and um when we're talking about your own team because we are focusing on that are there any shout outs you'd like to give or any people that have either mentored or inspired you either inside your team or, or, or outside uh I, well <laughs> all all the team thank you um you know you're awesome i love you all of you um they, you know, we have this dedicated group of awesome humans who sort of, you know, we all, uh, we're all on the same page. We all share the same values. Um, you know, works work, um, but we sort of all have a common purpose and, um, it's a, you know, it's a great place. And, and probably personally shout out for me, I don't know, probably dad, I guess I should acknowledge him. Uh, we worked together for a very long time. I learned a lot from him. A few things were not what to do, but mainly what to do. Um, so, Dad, if you're listening, uh, minute 42 on you, mate. to minute 43 <laughs> is probably the focus of this uh, this uh, particular uh, podcast. Um, you know, and he, you know, I I think saw that, I, I guess, ability in me to pick up the baton and keep going. So, I thank him for that. Well, that's probably one of the best, most heartfelt answers to that quite corporate question. So, I thank you for your candor um, and... Uh, you know, quite often people talk about and the great family businesses, and they talk about, you know, it's a it's a life uh, work life balance. But sometimes that is sort of you know working to achieve people's goals as well. Um, and Ivana, any anyone who's uh, mentored you? Well, I've, I have a few people that I lean on or reach out to when something's going on. I'll give them a call and you know say this is what's happening. What would you do? Or have you come across this before? And uh, if to name them, they're 
I guess they're people that I've known for a very long time and, and they're also in the industry and that would be um, – do I name them? You can if you want. <laughs> they're going to be listening. I know. Well, Debbie Rumbelow is – yeah, she's at Centrepoint and um, Anna Verderami at Palladia. They're two that I reach out to a lot and, yeah, just back and forth with each other. We help each other. Oh, that's fantastic. You know, look, the two fantastic answers to that question and, and, and giving people some gratitude publicly is always pretty positive. Um, I was then thinking about um, looking, uh, you know, you mentioned a future state around your business, where you're looking to go. You've mentioned your ambitions of, of growing. You've You've now done your first merger or acquisition or combination of both. I think Bess said that you you helped a friend out, Murray, from memory, um, uh, do a transition, probably a transition to retirement. Is that right? Murray was – Yep. Yep. So Very you've much. done that. Um, sounds like their clients were in great hands. Sounds like you are probably be able to carry on that legacy, which I know that especially in, in regional or even smaller towns, um, not that Adelaide's a smaller town, but in, in those regional areas, I think it's as much about – when you're selling your your life's work, that you want to be able to walk down the street, you know, two or three years later, and not, not not be told yeah. thanks for thanks for nothing, champion. But yeah. um, um, so in saying that, um, uh, are you looking in the next couple of years, or what, what's your what's your sort of runway for um for growing this business? Yesterday, yesterday, okay. So so that's that's the, that's that's the, the position state from the CEO. Ivana, anything more detailed <laughs> to go around that? Open to any opportunities today. Uh, awesome. So we we always like to talk about, um, you know, how Ensemble does it and community. And I think, um, Ben, when we were talking earlier, I asked, do you have a business coach? And you kind of paused for a moment and you said, you know what? A lot of the peers, a lot, a lot of peers, and, and there's a difference between peers and competitors. And the great thing about financial planning is there's a real uh, openness of what people are doing. And that's because there's just way more clients than most people. We can ever we can get the service, yep. correct? Yeah. So, so you, I think you mentioned that you you love reaching out to some peers and and them reaching out to you, and you've been on a couple of study tours, and that's been really instructive. Because I'm thinking, if I'm a company who goes to all the effort of putting study tours together, it'd be great to get some feedback, some li- some lasting feedback. Yeah. Um, so that's spot on. Uh, study tours was another sort of transformational. Um, way for me and I think you said before um, you know it can be pretty lonely you know in in this industry I think as a, as a principal of a financial planning firm it can be very isolating and everyone looks to you for the answers and um, you don't always have them so I was doing it for 25 years and I don't think I had one yeah well, you, you, <laughs> you, you played it well Roxy so yeah so I've I've met some great yeah, a lot of other principals from practices um over the years on, on study tours and there, there's a group of people and if they're listening to this, they they know who they are. Um, we all have each other, not in the favourites on, on our phones, but not, not too far back and that we can bounce ideas off of or um, I'm thinking about doing this and I'm that person for other, you know, other businesses that are a bit smaller than us and sort of want to get to where we are and, uh, I have other people I call who have businesses bigger than us and, you know, what problems have – I've got this problem and how do I solve it? And um, so that peer that peer group within the industry um, would be my business coach, I would say. I, I, I get great value out of that and I'm very thankful to those people for sharing and I'm happy to share whatever I've got. Well, if I'd like to enlighten both of you for the last period of time, this last hour you have shared – so you're giving back to the universe. And on that note, I'd love to thank Av- Avana um, for your time. Um, I'd love to thank you for all the detail that you gave me beforehand. Um, I'd also like to say that, and I'm going to throw this in, is that uh, this is how efficient this lady is. So when we arrived here for our podcast, Kieran the Sound Guy, she goes, the Reserve Bank is, um, is, is meeting today and I have one non-negotiable task, which is I have to do quickly – I have to quickly send out a notification to our our clients so that we're first and foremost in their mind. So at approximately halfway through, the alarm went ding. Ivana then went to work. Ben and I then pretended to work for 10 minutes, came back in, changed the demeanor and back into the podcast. So that's efficiency. That's what happens. That's why businesses need 
good general managers, good practice managers. That's why there's always an engine room behind every great CEO. And so with that, I'd like to thank Ben for your time. I'd like to thank Ivana and on behalf of Ensemble and the engine room. Thank you. Thanks, Roxy. Thanks for having us.